Welcome back to another episode of Vancouver Real. I am your host today, Andy Zaremba, and with me, as always, my brother Mike. Hey, everyone. Nice to be with you again for another awesome episode. Number 72, I believe, we're at now. So we're, we're climbing up there, bro. We're climbing, man. I can't wait to get to that century mark. That'll be fun. Um, as usual, we are recording out of 70 West Cordova Street, which is also known as Float House. And Float House, for those of you who don't know what it is, is sensory deprivation or flotation tanks. And for those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, a flotation tank is essentially what we're doing is we're creating an environment where we reduce sensory stimuli to the greatest degree that we can. So inside the float tank, there's no sight, no sound, minimal tactile sensation. There's actually 10 inches of water, which is super saturated with 800 pounds of Epsom salt. So you float effortlessly. And the whole point of it is to reduce sensory input coming into your body. And this generates all sorts of deep states of relaxation. It's great for rest, great for recovery, amazing for creativity and visualization. And if you've never checked it out, go to our website, floathouse.ca. And if you use the promo code RECOVERY, you will receive a 20% discount on a single float. So definitely check that out. We're on Facebook, YouTube, uh, floathouse.ca. And if you Google us, you will definitely find us. Yeah, and I just would like to say quickly and recognize the unceded Coast Salish lands that we uh, we inhabit as the city of Vancouver. Good job. We try to do that a little bit more often on this show is to recognize the indigenous population here in the First Nations. And so um, unceded Coast Salish people and Coast Salish land is what is really where we are inhabiting right now. Um, and finally, uh, or actually a couple more things. One, we will give a quick shout out to the LRA, the London Real Academy and uh, London Real. Brian Rowe is the man behind that show there uh, in which we are a spinoff podcast. Uh, we started this about two years ago now. And Brian's been doing this show for, oh, I bet you about five years, I'd say now. He's been on it. And he's really just, the evolution of his show has been incredible. He's now started what's called the London Real Academy, where it's an online uh, personal development and professional development community where people um, basically get linked up in different areas of their life and have accountability partners and they can network and communicate and share ideas and collaborate if, if need be. Um, Andy and I are part of the LRA and it's like 33 bucks a month. So it's it's a totally worthwhile community. So check it out, London Real Academy, and um, we'll probably give a shout out to Omega Point. Definitely, yeah. Our brother Omid over at Omega Point, thank you for all you do in the background. He does all of our edits and uh, make sure we sound and look really pretty. Well, more sound, actually. And he runs a really successful YouTube channel called Omega Point, which is just loaded with inspirational videos that he kind of cuts together from speakers like Alan Watts, um, Dr. Gabor Mate. Who else does he have on there? Um, Terrence McKenna. Those are like those are his big go tos for sure. Yeah, amazing stuff. Really inspiring, thought provoking videos. He produces those. He does a great job. He's also put together videos for Graham Hancock, uh, Jason Silva. I think he's even made one for Joe Rogan at one point. Yeah, and so, he did a really cool video for us when we did our Float House Members Appreciation Night uh, when we had TJ Daw, one of our past Vancouver Real guests, a three time guest actually, who's a, a one man uh, artist, performance um, theater artist. Artist, and he did a, a private showing of uh, his play called Medicine, and Omid helped produce that as well. This was on YouTube, so you can search Medicine on YouTube, TJ Daw. Absolutely. So we should get into it. Today, I am very excited to continue the TEDx Stanley Park interviews, which I have been so honored and humbled to do uh, by our mutual friend, Roger Killen, the producer of TEDx Stanley Park. And today I will be interviewing another one of the speakers named Dan Locke. And Dan the Man Locke, as it says on your website, is a serial entrepreneur, best-selling author, internet marketing authority. Um, and you you seem to be all over the place. You're ABC, NBC, Fox News, CBC, Amazon. You're all over the internet. <laughs> and you also have several books. Yes. Would you like to tell me about uh, which books you published? I have written 12 books, and I'm doing another new book uh, this year. And so I wrote my first book in my early 20s. Amazing. And just self-published. And yeah. it was a book called 
quick term marketing, which at the time I still have the company. It was it's my company name. Now Andy, don't ask me what it means. I have no idea. I just came up with a name at the time. Hey, you wrote a book at nineteen. <laughs> yeah, you know, so that's pretty impressive. And and at the time, and you know what? It's 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 the, my first book. It's my worst book, but I did it. Uh, I'm, I'm glad it, it's probably out of print right now. Right. Uh, and you, you find any on eBay and stuff, let me know. I'll buy it back from you because I, <laughs> I, I don't want it floating out there. Hey, you okay, never mind. Though, right? Just delete that. That book doesn't exist. Yeah, it, it doesn't exist. But that's my first book on marketing. Awesome. On marketing. And then from there, I've done a number of books. Now, most of them are on, on Amazon. Uh, I think my most well-known book is a book called F.U. Money. F you money. Yeah. Yeah. I like that title right there. <laughs> um, so you can go to uh, denlock.com and you can see all of his media, all of his books, his workshops, speaking, and uh, you do a lot, right? You do a I lot. I do quite a bit. And soon you'll be speaking at TEDx Stanley Park. That's correct. Yeah. So yes. what's, go- what's your speech going to be on? What's the topic of your speech? Uh, the topic is on the invisible force. So we're going to talk about, I'm the opening speaker for TEDx Danny Park. So I'll be the first speaker. It kind of sets up the, creates the context for the rest of the speakers of why great ideas don't succeed. How come you, you go to something like TEDx Danny Park and you get inspired, you get motivated, you go to a workshop and then people go home and they don't do anything. Like, why is that? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to, so at TEDx, I'm going to dive into that and what stops people from, from taking action. And of course, you and I know most of the time it's themselves. Yeah, Mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. And we also have a different connection of sorts. Yes. And that would be from, of course, the $50 billion man, (laughs) Dan Pena, who also mentored one of our mentors, which is, of course, Brian Rose from the London Real Podcast. Correct. And you've been working with Dan Pena for quite a while now, haven't you? I think now almost eight years. Eight years? Yeah. Dan's been my mentor for more, almost eight years. Now, everything I've heard about Dan... Um, I call he, him Big, Big Dan. Big like, Dan. Know, Big Dan. He's pretty intense, isn't he? It is very intense. He's very intense. very intense. What you see is what you get. What you see is what you get. And he will... He'll shake you up, you know? However, we've, we've seen a massive shift in Brian from the time when he first started London Real. Definitely. I, I, to, I see that shift too. <laughs> to now what he's doing. Now, he has switched his content around quite a bit. Yeah. Um... However, he's also really stepped up his whole production. Yeah. His production's way better. He's created the London Real Academy. Yeah. Which I'm a member of as well. Oh, you're part of the LRA? Well, yeah. you should be coming to our meetups then. Yeah, sure. We have London Real Academy meetups. Um, we're actually growing the London Real Academy in Vancouver. Very nice. Very so nice. So we're gonna we're actually gonna have our first meetup on May 14th. Very nice. And uh, it was we we did our first speaker series with, like I said, uh, Philip McKernan. Mm. Uh, and that was in part with the LRA. Okay. Um, and, uh, yeah, so we're growing that community here. Yeah, so if you ever want to come out to an LRA meeting, let me know. Yeah. Yeah. We have, we're growing this community here. So, which is pretty cool. Yeah. I like, I like what, what Brian's doing. He's trying to, from the audience now turn into more like a, a, a business model. Right. Where you can monetize it. I think it's great because then you can grow, you can attract more members, you yeah. can impact more lives. I think definitely. It's great. And, and again, like he stepped up his game completely. Yeah. And that's what sure. it seems like Dan Pena does to people. Definitely. Right. <laughs> so you probably <laughs> like it or not. Whether you like it or not. However, <laughs> did you like it? I loved it. Uh, when I first, I'll tell the story how I found how I found Dan, basically. At the time I was browsing on the internet, on eBay. I just, you know, I buy books and personal development books and success books and things like that. And it, I, and then before that, I've already read a ton of books, right? I've been to, you know, Tony Robbins and seminars. And I, I would describe myself as a success junkie. Yeah. Like I love that stuff. And then I came across Dan's book on eBay and I saw the price tag of the book. It was about, it was $400 US. <laughs> Okay, on eBay. Wow. Used copy. Yeah. I'm like, what kind of stupid idiot would spend 400 bucks on a book? Okay. <laughs> right. But it has the first chapter on, on that description in, on, you know, on the eBay listings. After I read that first chapter, two minutes later, I bought the book. <laughs> okay. Wow. wow. I bought the book. And when I got the book, it was the most profound book I've ever read because it's so raw and so true. Because after I read all these success books, there's always something missing. I don't know what it is. I can't pinpoint what it is. But from Dan's Big Dance book, it answers it answers all my questions of what it takes, actually, to, it takes to be successful, what it takes to be a high-performance person, how, how money is actually made in, in business. So that changed my life from there. Then I went to the Castle Seminar. 
um, that's how we developed developed the relationship. Uh, in fact, before I went to the castle seminar, I contacted uh, Dan at the castle. So I called him up, uh, and Dan gave me a challenge, and said, "You know what? I, I, when I call him, I didn't even know I was like nervous as hell. I was I didn't know what to say. I said, "Oh, Dan, I read your book. I'm so inspired. Keep in mind, I was in my 20s." So it's very intimidating to, yeah. to be talking to him. And he said, well, you know, young man, I'll be in, you know, uh, Los Angeles next week. Why don't we do breakfast? Wow. So you, uh, you jumped on that. I jumped on that. I flew there. We had breakfast. I had like full suit, red tie, because I like, I know he, that's what he likes. Yeah. Fold on. And we had breakfast. We talked for about two hours or so. And then afterwards, and I said, you know, Dan, you know, can I... Can I come work for you? Can I? What can I do? How can I learn more from you? Can I be your mentee? And he said, "No way in hell." That's what he said. Wow. And I said, "Oh, that's kind of rude." I flew all the way here, this and that. He said, "You're not ready, kid." He's always calls me kid. Still calls me kid. And I said, "Well, then, then when, when would I be ready?" He said, "You're not ready." I said, "Okay." And, and <laughs> I took that and said, and so from then on, we kept in contact. We kept in contact, and then I went to the castle, uh, and but. I think at the time Dan was, well, I was too young, too naive, but I think he was also testing me to see, you know, what, what, what I'm capable of. And, and I'm happy to say now today, I'm, he calls me his superstar. I'm, I'm honored. I mean, on his wall of fame, you see my photo and stuff. So, so I'm, I'm wondering if part of his initial rejection is even a little test to see if you'd come back. It could be. It could be, if I cannot even take that person to rejection, then, you know, I don't have what it takes. Yeah. But I think he just does it to everybody, just to see what you kind of... What you do, how you react. You. Yeah, how you react. And I didn't take it personally, because I thought maybe I'm not good enough. So I came back to Vancouver, I worked hard on myself, developed my skill sets, learned business, marketing. I've always been a very dedicated learner, still, still today. I mean, I read about two to three books a week. I wow, still amazing. constantly learn podcasts, we videos, and things like that. So, what are your top podcasts? Mm -hmm. What are your favorite podcasts? I would say uh, myself. My podcast is pretty good. Oh, okay. <laughs> ah, damn, wow. yeah, What's your podcast? podcast uh, called? Shoulders of Titans at shouldersoftitans.com. Every cool. single week, I interview a successful entrepreneur. Uh, my podcast is good. That's why I launched it. It's more like kind of like what you guys is doing. It's a, a it's a passion project. Yes, uh, and. I mean, smart passive income is pretty good, but I like podcasts, not so much who, but I like the topic. I like to listen to podcasts by people who has been there and done that. Right. So mm. you kind of like the, the stories based in experience and something you can take something yeah. away from. So you can yeah. learn something from it. Yeah. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Excellent. And um, how, so you went, you went, you met Dan Pena. Yeah. And then you went to do a seminar in the castle. Yeah. Okay. And at the time, oh. Dan was now nowadays he doesn't do it. At the time, back then he was still hitting people. Just so you know, <laughs> he was hitting people. He was hitting people. <laughs> wow, that's hardcore. It's hardcore. Does not mess around. It doesn't. So mess tell around. me about the castle and what went on there and and how that experience was for you. Well, first first of all, when I went there, I mean it, it's a I, I don't know I don't know how much Dan charges now. Back then, I think it was ten thousand uh, pounds plus travel and everything. It's it's for it's a long. long for seven days. Seven days, okay. Uh, and then I went there, and, and then when you got to the airport, it's still the, from the airport to his home probably is another two hours on cap. Like, you I mean, you're going far away from the city, and then I'm like, where the hell is this place, right? And right. You get to the gate, and then you walk in. It's beautiful, a golf course, everything. It's huge. I mean, the place is massive. Uh, I would say the experience, first of all, the first couple of days, I would say I wasn't very comfortable because you're at a castle, you, you know, Dan has a maid and, and you eat the best food and, you know, breakfast, just ring a bell and your butler, the whole nine yards. Like as a young guy, you're not used to, to that kind of lifestyle. Yeah. Um, but I mean, Andy, after a couple of days, he's just kind of like, you know, this is pretty good. I, 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 yeah, I can get used to it. This is, this is neat. This, yeah. is, this is nice. Right. Um, that expands my context and say, this is, this is nice. Like, I could get used to this. But I would say that seven days, the biggest thing I got, I got from it is not so much the techniques. And, and Dan teaches techniques, you know, how to raise capital, how to buy companies, how to do all these things. It's But more the first two, three days is all kind of mindset stuff I would refer to. How to be a high performance person. All right. And what are some of the keys that 
you could say that you learn from that experience to increase your mindset to be mm. a high performer? Number one, I would your mindset. I would say Dan always talks about that you got to you got to be you got to be think you got to think big. That I was thinking way too small. So before I went to the castle, I was focusing more become being a lifestyle entrepreneur. You know, just you know, work. Tim Ferriss. Yeah, Tim Ferriss. Kind of yeah, don't get me started on that. I have a whole philosophy on that. I I like him, but you know, the book. I think the four hour work week thing. I don't I don't I don't buy into that. Um, so. That was my goal. That was my what how I was operating. I was playing a, a, a smaller game, I would say. So going to the castle that expand my horizons for sure. Thinking bigger, uh, just like Big Dan said, you know, just add a couple of zeros to your goals. Not so much for the money, but who do you have to be and who what what kind of skill sets and and you need to develop. How many people you have to impact. So that was good. Um, second thing is. There was a guy that I met there. His name, I think, is Sam, if I remember correctly. Uh, Sam, at the time, he he was he just sold his company. Young guy, probably thirty something, maybe late thirties. He just sold his company for like twelve or fifteen million dollars. So he was just hanging out at the castle, right? So he was there we, before we arrived. He stayed after, even we, everybody's gone. So I talked with him. Him that the, he expands my horizons as well. So I think that thinking bigger. That whatever goal you have, and second thing is definitely not care what people think, because mm. as an immigrant coming to Canada, coming to Vancouver, when I was growing up in high school, I wasn't very popular. I had very very few friends, and because I couldn't speak the language, so so very much so, I growing up, I care a lot how people perceive me, but then after that, I was out. You know, screw this. Damn, who, who gives a damn? Yeah. So so from there that frees me up to do a lot more things of building, speaking, building a personal brand, writing books. and Because, you know, you would think, oh, you're too young to write a book. You're too young to do this. You're too whatever to do that. No, I don't buy that anymore. So It's a story. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one of the most empowering thoughts I've ever had in my life. Yes. And it's, it's kind of along the lines of what you touched on there of not caring people think. Yeah. However, I reframed it still a little bit because, you know, I do care people think. I yes. want to know what people think. However, my kind of breakthrough was I'm okay with being disliked. Yes. So that, and then I'm also, and I went even further in it yes. is that I'm okay with being hated. Yes. And that's a really powerful place to be in because yes. it allows you to fully be you. Yes. And if someone's judging you for whatever actions you're doing, whatever you're doing in your life, whatever you say, yeah. it doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. So you can go, it, it frees you up. Correct. And it could be more polarizing. You're going to have some people that don't like you. Mm -hmm. However, are you ever going to please anybody? Yep. Or everybody. Yep. I think it's impossible, right? Yes. And I now I subscribe to the philosophy more. I, you can care about other people without caring what they think. Yes. Mm. I that's, think that's, that's good. good. Okay. So you could you could care and from that, I mean, if you if you if you if Big Dan was here, if you ask him the question, he would how he would describe me, I think he would describe I take the QLA, the quantum leap advantage principles and apply it in my own way. So I don't do exactly 100% of what Dan teaches. I kind of have my own style and my own spin. It's a little bit different, but I apply the principles of it. It's like I always use it as a comparison, a metaphor. It's like kind of like martial art. You kind of you learn from learn from this style, maybe karate. You take boxing and you master that. And But after a while, you kind of become – I'm a martial artist as well. So you kind right. of develop your own thing that, you know what, maybe that – particular style teaches a lot. Let's say Taekwondo teaches kicking. Well, but I'm a short dude. What do I do? I can't kick the damn guy, yeah. but I, I have natural speed. So maybe I should, you know, my punch or my, my grappling or my finger jab is a bit better. And then it becomes mixed martial arts. Yeah, it becomes more of a mixed martial arts. So it's, I, think, I think the same thing with KL, KLA. Um, I'll tell you something a bit, a little bit personal. So when I follow Dan's principles, KLA, I would say my success went from like this to that. When I when I get to a point when I was twenty, I would say 27, 28, I would say you could quote unquote made it. I become a millionaire status, awesome. Twenty seven years old, pretty proud of myself, right? Fucking miserable. You're miserable. I was miserable. I was I wasn't happy, and I didn't know why. I worked so hard for my entire life. When I was growing up, college, I never party once. I never drink once. I was working every day. No vacations for five years. That's what the sacrifice. 
that I made. That's the pay the price I paid. How come when I got here, I felt so empty? What the hell is this? Mm. They never addresses that. Then what I found out is because I was trying to copy Big Dan. I was trying to be like him. I was trying to do everything he does because I looked up to him as a role model because my mom and dad got divorced when I was 16. So I didn't, I don't have a father figure. So he becomes my father figure. But that's actually not who I am because my mo both mom and dad, they are like the extreme. So imagine Big Dan here, ruthless, tough. Mom and dad, volunteer type charity type people. So like, you can see like you have this internal Very conflict. Very conflicting. Yeah, so, but it's like, what do, what do I do? So then I found out, you know what? I need to be somewhere in the middle that I can have the business acumen, I can have the toughness when needed to be, but I need to be more of like my mom and dad. Like a humanitarian he, type. Exactly. So that right. changes everything. Like I would say before I got this, before I realized this, I was much more, let's say if you and I met probably four years ago, I don't think we would have connect as much because I was the guy, you know what? It's all about the money. It is, it's the chips on the table, it's all mine. I want to grab as, as, much, as many chips as possible. Uh, it's, it, there's no free lunch. Anyone who wants to have lunch, you pay. I want to have lunch with people who don't pay. It, that was my mentality and it's wrong. Right. So then from there, and then I changed to now, you know what? It's not like that. That's, what, that's not what life is about. So now it changed the way I operate. It changed the way I view money. It changed the way I view life. Uh, also, it helps when I met my wife. She, she brings a lot of balance in my life. Mm. It's like, relax, have some fun. Like, <laughs> yeah. don't have to be so intense all the time. And so now I, it's the much more, I would say I have the intention uh, of more, like you said, it's, it's helping others, but still combined with that business acumen. And the funny thing is when I combine the two, business is more, more successful, everything is easier, money is easier, you, you, I'm happier, I'm more fulfilled, I have more friends, I have more fun. Uh, so th this state, I'm, I'm the happiest I would yeah. say in my life. And that balance is so key, yes. isn't it? Yes. And so many people, it's interesting to listen to your progression. Yes. It's getting you to a place where, okay, I feel good about myself enough where I can go and make some money, I can go create something, I can build a business. Yes, it and is. Then you go too far down that path yes. and you need to be pulled back. Yes. And luckily you had that balancing act in your life where your yes. wife comes in and says, like, okay, Dan, let's chill out a little bit. Yes. Bring it back. You know. However, now you're more fulfilled, more well-rounded. Yes, I would say right. that. Yep. And I think that's such a key point there yep. is so many people go to one extreme or the other. Like they'll go to extreme business you yes. know, or they'll go to I'm going to be an extreme hippie. Yeah. And I'm not going to do anything. Yes. And, you know, maybe you do some volunteer work, do some nice things mm -hmm. here in business. You're making a lot of money. It's really good for you. It's good yes. for your family. However, where's that happy medium? Correct. Right? Correct. And that's what you're touching and, on. And that's, that's, and again, but that's just what works for me. And I found that that's, I am the happiest at, at, at in, in this perfect balance that I can have both, that I could help, but I can also have the business acumen. That helps a lot because anything I do is I want to help other people, but how can I help it in a bigger way? in a, a more impactful way? Or can I build a business around this? Using my intelligence, can I build a social enterprise doing this so it's sustainable, it's profitable, so I can, I can hire the best people. At the same time, you can make a difference. Right. Uh, it's like I could say, it's easy to write a check. Anyone who's successful you can write a check. But how can you not write a check and have 10 times more impact? Now that takes... Not write a check and yeah. have 10 times more impact. How that takes intelligence. How would you do that? It's much more about building a team, uh, using the resources, leveraging versus, you know what? They say, I can write a check. I want to donate to a certain, certain charity. That's good. Do that. I do that too. But if I want to help this charity long-term, how can I do something that can help them long-term? What else do they need besides money? Because let's say whatever foundation you want, to, you want to support, they may not may, may not be running the damn thing very efficiently. What more can I do beyond than just writing the check? Exactly. So going in there, potentially... Finding inefficiencies. Totally. Right? Totally. I mean, why write them a check for $10,000 when or they whatever can only, you're going to write yeah. if it's going to go to waste half of it? Totally. Right? So you go in there, how could you make whatever they're doing a little bit better? Yeah. So it's the same thing now, the philosophy they're not, Smart. you know, I work with entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. People say to me, oh, you know, Dan, you work with entrepreneurs, you turn around companies. And I always say, that I don't, I don't work, when I go into a business, there's a turnaround situation, I never work on the business. I just work on the entrepreneur. You fix the entrepreneur, you fix the business. 100%. Leadership top to bottom. Let me ask you this. What mm. is, 
the most common, um, I'm not going to say mistake or error or flaw. Yeah. What is, what is the most common thing that entrepreneurs can improve upon that you see? Very simple. Ego. Ego. They don't ask for help because they started the business because they want to be their own boss. They want to have freedom. I want to make my own decisions. I want to do things my way. And ego, I think, kills more businesses than anything else. They are so emotionally attached to the idea so they can't take criticism. They can't take feedback. So they say, oh, this is great. Everybody will love it. Let me mortgage my house. Let me launch this product. Well, have you done your research? Do you know who your competitors are? Who is selling this? What's your profit margin? They know nothing about it. Yeah. And so that's, I think that's the issue. I always say the number one key to business success is avoid bad assumptions. Yes. So they assume it's going to work. They assume, oh, you know what? When I launch this, everybody will love it. But what if they don't love it? Right. They assume we're going to be profitable in six months. What if it's not profitable in one year? What if it's not profitable in two years? What if it's not profitable five years? Then what do you do now? So they are, we are naturally optimistic as entrepreneurs. So yeah. ego, definitely. It's and it, definitely and it's ego. such a fine balance too because you have to have that drive. Yes. And you have to have that belief and you have to have that, I'm going to go through this and make this successful no matter what. Yes. However, you also have to pull back and you also have to say, is, am, I, am I putting the blinders on too much here? Yeah. All right. Am I going to blind myself from uh, and put myself in a bad situation? And, and also being humble enough to know when you're not, uh, you know, the best person for the job or, or a certain task or uh, whatever asset. Because you can't do it all when you're an entrepreneur. Like mm -hmm. at the beginning, you kind of do wear all the hats. Yes. But you know that, you know, some of those hats don't fit your head. Yes. Because your head's too big or too small. Well, yeah. And um, you got to be able to recognize which hats don't fit well and then, you know, hire appropriately or outsource It's or like whatever. knowing, I say, it's about knowing yourself and all knowledge ultimately leads to self-knowledge. That mm. it's understanding yourself, your strength, your weaknesses, being able to, to, to ask for help. I don't know why most entrepreneurs, they just don't ask for help. They just don't ask. Well, you know what, I man? I think it's like you, as an entrepreneur, you have to have a certain amount of balls. Yes. You know, for lack of a better you way of saying it. You need a lot of balls. You need some guts, mm. right? You got to have a little bravery. Yes. And those people are tough. Yes. A lot of times entrepreneurs are a little bit thicker skin, a little tougher. They're like, yes. I can do this. Yes. I don't need help. Yes. You know, one book I read that was really useful for me mm. was um, the book by Howard Schultz. And he was Pull not the founder. Yeah. 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 Pull your heart into Pull it. Pull your heart into it. Not yeah. the founder of Starbucks. However, he went into Starbucks very early yeah. on and he mm -hmm. made the company great. Mm -hmm. And um, funny thing is when he left the company... Uh, for a few years, it started going down. Starbucks, mm -hmm. and then they actually hired him back and just like turned around again, right? <laughs> I mean, you have to have a champion like that behind the business so yeah. often. He said one of the biggest challenges for him, and this might be a similar idea, mm. is that he had to get used to the idea of hiring people that could do the job better than him. Correct. Correct. And as an entrepreneur, I always say our job is not to not to do everything. Uh, we are like a, a, a more like an orchestra. It's we organize other people, resources, money, capital, whatever it is, to make our vision become a reality. That's what we do. So we cannot just be, you know, and that's why, you know, you read, if you've heard of the book E Myth by Michael Gerber, that most E Myth stands for Entrepreneur Myth. You know, I haven't even read that one yet, and everyone keeps saying read E Myth. Yeah, it's basically what Michael talks about that most entrepreneurs are not entrepreneurs, they are technicians mm. suffering from an entrepreneurial seizure. Mm. That they, they are, you know what, I'm a plumber, I'm going to start a plumbing business. I'm a lawnmower, I'm going to start a lawn mowing business. Because as I'm good at it, I'll do that and then become a self-employed type kind of thing. But that's not entrepreneurship. You know, that's why I can involve with different industry and different companies when I am not one of them, quote unquote. I don't know how to do the technical work, but I understand the industry and know how to build a company and build a team around that and solve a, a problem in the marketplace for them. That's how, that's how business is. Entrepreneurs, we are problem solvers. We solve problems at a profit. The bigger the problem, the bigger the profit. That's all we do. Right. Going back to a little bit about Dan Pena, because mm. this episode I feel like is going to be very popular amongst the LRA because mm. of the subject matter. You're one of Dan Pena's, uh, you know, success stories for sure, yes. right? Um, what would you say that Dan does best to bring out the best in people when he's working with people individually? Mm, I think Dan just, he just believes in you. He just believes in you when you don't even believe in yourself. I mean, when I was a 
punk kid. He's like, why? Why are you thinking so small? Like, why? Why are you mucking around with? He all okay. Remember when I was at the castle? I was already you know building, doing my internet thing, making good money. And he's like, why are you monkey or this internet bullshit? Like your inter- we, we, he calls it internet, you know, scammers, right? Mm. So this internet bullshit, is bigger things. Well, yeah, what's bigger things? I thought this is it. That's not it. And there's just something about him that I don't know what it is. When you're around him, you just, you want to take more risk. You want to be bolder. You want to, I, at least me, I want to make him proud. Uh, I, I want to do things that I just like, I would always think of whatever I'm working on. And you can say I'm 34 years old now. For some people you say, oh, Danny, it's, you're very successful. But when I compare to Big Dan, I'm like, what would Big Dan say? It's all relative, right? Yeah, it's like, well, yeah, compared to who? Compared to people at your age? Yeah, you are successful. But what if you've only accomplished this much and this is your potential? Now what? Mm-hmm. So I, I could just hear Big Dan saying, you could do so much more. You're 34. When you get to 40, when you get to 45, when you're 50, why not 10 exit? Why not 100, 100 exit, right? Let me ask you this. So you were doing the internet marketing thing for a while yeah. when you were with Dan. What was the next big thing that you got into? What was that big leap that you took after Still that? within internet, but it changed the way I operate within internet. So internet's my, you could say my skill set. Internet marketing is my specialty. But instead of running it like, let me give you an example. There's a difference between a, a money maker and a business. Okay, a money maker it is a website with an ebook, digital product, driving traffic to it. You're making a little bit of money. You're bidding a list. That's decent as a money maker, but that's not a business. Because a business, you have a customer base. You have a unique selling you know advantage in the marketplace. You, you can scale it. Uh, I think it, the biggest difference is after I met with Dan, I had a before I had a lot of money makers. Then I switch to more, I want to build something within an industry. I want to build a company. I want to scale it up. Um, and one of the success stories I can share with you is a company called Charm Junction. And we market and distribute uh, a brand of jewelry called Pandora. You know, those bracelets. Oh, those ones. Those ones, yes. Yeah, the I ladies. Pandora. Yeah, the Pandora. If anyone so, has a girlfriend, you probably know Pandora. Yeah, so Pandora. So uh, in e-commerce business, we are one of the, we're the number one like e-commerce company. We're only, one of the only two distributors that can sell Pandora online across Canada. So we started a company a number of years ago, real business, real clients, right? We, you know, helping, you know, making, selling these jewelry online. And that, it changes everything. So that's an example. Uh, and we grew the company just leaps and bounds in 2012. We won the Canada Post Online Retail of the Year Award um, through that business, and that's one example. So from there, I just got involved with more different types of businesses versus do I just do this to just make a little bit of money, or am I trying to build something sustainable for the long term? Okay. I think that changes my philosophy quite a bit. Gotcha. Yeah. Now, going into a few of your books, perhaps, you sure. said your most popular one is the F.U. Money book. Yeah, I wrote that about five years ago. Right, I'm looking at it but right I now. I still a, a prick. F.U. Money, <laughs> make as much money as you want and live your life a as damn you well damn please. well please. Mm. That's an impact. That sounds like a Dan Pena statement right yeah, there. Yeah, it is. Dan Pena rubbing off on oh, you. Yeah, yeah. So what, what's this book about? So the book, it's... The book, I'll tell you the, the original title of the book. Okay. It, it was something like how to use the internet to build your dream lifestyle or, or something like that. Right. That was the original title. Now, it's not that good of a title. So say again, how to use the internet, <laughs> how, how to, use the internet to build your dream Just lifestyle. Just like every other ebook you see. Yeah, some, some shit like that. Days. I forgot what I see it is. 10 of those a day. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, I don't want to do another one of those books. Yeah. Uh, and finally, I was actually um, having lunch with a friend of mine, um, Dave, at the Thai house. In, in oh, downtown. Yeah. I love Thai House. Yeah, and we were talking and said, we were brainstorming. I said, I need a concept. I need something that that's lands. Yeah. So, well, you know, and I show him the kind of the manuscript and he looked at it. Oh, this is, this is pretty edgy, Dan. This is pretty. And then we talked somehow and then we just came up with, you know, what, what's, what are you trying to get people to do? Well, the, I said the outcome is to get to a point where you don't take shit from nobody. Basically say, fuck you if you don't like that person. He said, why don't you call it F you money? Fuck you money. He said, okay, <laughs> there we go, right? We go. And, and that was actually, we came up with the F, we call F you number. Mm. And then later on, we changed it to F you money before we publish it. But it's, it's about 
it's I think it will have to book it on success principles. Some of that from QLA, uh, but with my own spin to it. Okay. And then half the book it's about business and internet marketing. What, what are one of those success principles? So my laser beam focus, again from from Big Dan, that you got to fo- focus on. You know, high performance people focus on the few, not the many. That you are, it takes a long time to master something, and nowadays, especially the young guys, I mean, they 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 can't focus. They jump from one thing to another. You can see they, they, they're doing their thing. They're doing social media. They, they can't even have a conversation like this. You say the younger generation, millennial types. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think that's an issue. Um, but yeah, even business owner, they, they don't give enough time for the business to succeed. So on one hand, we need to know how to avoid bad assumptions. On the other hand, they, they can't focus. They yeah. just can't focus. And then most people actually are not very productive, quite frankly. Out of all the thousands of entrepreneurs that I meet, they say, I work very, very hard. I, well, but you ain't doing shit. Mm. So I can see that. Yeah, they're not very productive if they're yeah. honest with themselves. Yeah. You know what I think happens with a lot of entrepreneurs? And I, I, the reason I might be able to point this out, because I've seen it myself from time to time. You, got it. you know, when we open a business, uh, you go through a hyper productivity. You know, when you're right before the weeks before, months before opening a new business, especially like something like there's a brick and mortar, you know, you're just work, 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 right? Yeah. And then after a while, you're like, I need a break. And you go into this kind of lull for a uh-huh, little bit. Uh-huh. And it's easy to stay in that lull. Very easy. So for myself, I find it very important to uh, do something to shake me up a little bit. Yes. Like, uh, for example, I've done quite a bit of personal development work. Nice. Um, different things like that. And every time I do something, it kind of charges me up again. Yes. And I'm like, okay, let's go. Yeah. Right. And I, I, and I find when you work for yourself, especially if you're the head of a company, you're mm-hmm. the top dog, so to speak, mm-hmm. you know, it's very easy. To, to kind of rest on your laurels and, and get comfortable, right? Because there's nobody above you pushing you. Yes. Right? So you got to push yourself or have somebody who, you know, can hold you accountable, essentially. Just like um, another good friend of mine, Peter Sage, who's been on L- London Real. I've yeah. known Peter for more than a decade now. Yeah. Peter's also a, a mentee of uh, uh, Big Dan. And Peter talks about in life, you know, kind of do- go through four stages, right? You know, so, but um, now I would say before, again, I was more achiever, overachiever, type A, whatever it takes, let's do it, let's make it happen. If it doesn't work, put in twice as much effort. One call doesn't work, you call the guy 10 times, just push. Yeah. Uh, but now I am much more kind of like here in, 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 in the flow. More balanced. More, not just balance, it, there's a difference. Not, it's, it's the flow that I'm not attached to the outcome. Hmm. That's huge. I'm not attached, so I'm still, Strive to be my best, but not for, I got to make this work. If I don't get this deal, if I don't make this money, then I'm a fucking loser. It's not that. It's, you know what? I do my best. If it works, great. If it doesn't, doesn't really matter. I think that's such a huge point. And again, it, it does really help address the fear um, yeah. behind starting your own business or entrepreneurship. Yeah. You know, not being attached to the outcome of anything. Correct. Because, I mean, you can start any project with the best intentions that you want in the world, yeah. and there is zero guarantees. Yeah. Right. So it's like I, I must spend first ten years of my life as entrepreneur. We set goals and we set objectives. And but if you know you two would sit down with like, you know Mike and Andy and say, hey, you know Dan, what's your goal? I could tell you, I say, I don't have one. At this point of life, I don't have. I have a lot of things I want to do. I have objectives I want to go, but actually, I don't have goals because it's not like I want to accomplish this in one year. If I don't, I don't. You know, take my company to this much millions in revenue, then it's not good. Yeah, I actually don't have that. So, you know what? I have that goal, kind of roughly. I'm going to the direction. Yeah, I just I'm just enjoying the journey. I think that, nah, that's a good tagline. I'm just too. Enjo- I'm just enjoying the journey. Uh, and was, uh, and the funny thing is, it's truly it's I'm happier. I'm more fulfilled. Just it's great. Like I don't know how to. It's 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 a, it's a feeling. It's a feeling. I understand that. I think it kind of eases the pressure a little bit. Yeah. You know, and again, it's just like, yeah, you know, you're just, you're throwing things out there. Yeah. If they don't work, it's sure. okay. And it's not going to break you. You know, I had one entrepreneur on here uh, a while ago, won't mention his name. And he was just saying how after a business fails, you know, he sits around, he wallows. It mm. takes time for him to recover. Yeah. And uh, I could see why because you get attached. It's like, it's like raising a child almost. Yeah. You know, and if it doesn't work, you you know, you can feel quite dejected, feel like a bit of a failure. Because However, for me, I think, I feel like if something were to happen, I could just be, okay, that one didn't work. Yeah. On to the next one. Yeah. And, and, and you are, you're not your business. You are you. 
So as an as a entrepreneur, here's how I describe entrepreneur. I believe an entrepreneur is an artist in commerce. I agree. Great definition. So it, we we paint this picture. We want thing. to create this this vision, turn our vision into reality. So we just we paint, we create, we create it. That's what we do. So it's not so much like, oh, I paint this picture. Oh, it doesn't look so good. Someone doesn't like it. Oh my God, I'm such a bad artist. It's not like that. It's, hey, you know what? Yeah, this is pretty good, but I think the next one will be better. Let's, let's give it a try. Let's make some adjustments. With, with that kind of mentality, now it's easy, of course, you might say, well, Dan, easy for you to say, right? You don't have to worry about you know, money, that kind of stuff. But it's exactly if you have, you're starting from nothing, and if you uh, don't have a whole lot, it's more important to be in that flow state. Because if you can get there, I can tell you things just happened. People just showed up out of nowhere. And you can't even predict it. If you believe in the law of attraction and things like that, and this is not woo foo foo, like this is practical stuff, very practical stuff. You can get into the flow, opportunity just shows up. You know, that's interesting, the whole law of attraction kind of thing. And that's something I struggle with a little bit because I, you know, I have trouble with the idea that if I think about something, it's going to show up for me. Mm. However, a lot of times it does happen that yes. way. It just does happen that way. And it could be a, a combination of maybe the universe conspiring to help yes. you reach your objective, your goal. Or perhaps it's you're just so determined and so focused, focused and you're looking for mm -hmm. that thing. Mm -hmm. And then when that thing shows up, you know exactly what it is. And you're that's like, exactly that's it. What it is. Yeah. It's like I don't – anything in life that will give you an advantage, that's too – like I believe in feng shui. It's like, oh, I don't believe in feng shui, I believe in feng shui. I say, who cares? It, believe it or not, if you, you move a few things, move a few furnitures, if you believe that will bring you more prosperity, more success, why the hell not? It doesn't cost a whole lot. Mm -hmm. So if that would give you an edge, heck, do it, right? It's like reading that book would give you an edge, let's do it. Right. It doesn't harm you. The psychological advantage. Yeah, so if you believe in law of attraction, you believe that's kind of how it works, hey, you know what, if that works for you, go for, go it. for it. It doesn't really matter. Do it. Yeah. How it works, I don't care. Have you found with uh, your, you know, your kind of more contemporary approach mm -hmm. that that's helped your creativity? And, and, and if so, in what ways, like, have you found yeah, yourself being more creative? Yeah, because then you're not, not coming from a place. I always say needy is creepy. Okay, a lot of sometimes entrepreneurs, mm. they're needy. Mm. They're the, oh my God, I got to get to sell. I got to sell this client. I got to close this. I got to get this loan. I got to do whatever. Mm -hmm. But when you're coming from a place, not scarcity, but from abundance, because you're not attached to the outcome, the other party can sense it. That, you know what? We're negotiating a deal, but actually, you know, Andy doesn't care if he gets a deal or not. Hmm, he's not thinking about the money. Okay, in that case, then he may have my best interest at heart because it's just not, just not dollar signs, right? Okay, let's do a deal. People want to do a deal with a guy like that. They don't want to yeah. deal with it. It's all money. I want to get it. I want to win. I get paid. People, people don't want it. That frantic energy, nobody likes. And that it. desperation energy nobody too, right? It. Like it's just yeah. And that's why people want to do business with successful people, and success breeds success. Because successful people, it's like you know what? Yeah, we do it. It's we, more chill. It's, it's more chill. Yeah. It's all we do this. It's good. If it does not good, it's okay. Exactly. They're not, then it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's different. Because the desperation is almost, uh, it's a red flag. Totally, it is. It's just like this guy, for whatever reason, it's not working for him at this point. Yeah. And yeah. he's really, he needs to make this happen. Yeah. yeah. And obviously, if he needs to make it happen that badly, mm -hmm. perhaps there's something mm -hmm. not right there. Would he cross the line? You know, would, would, would he? Will, he sc will you stab me in the back? Yeah. Would he, st we know, if necessary, we don't know. Yeah. Uh, so that, he, yeah. Or, or is he just not a, a really savvy businessman? perhaps yeah, that that too so yeah so i'm not so now the flow state i think it's just awesome it's easy to say not easy to do i was just gonna say that man like listening on this stuff i agree with it all i think it's wicked advice but even myself i find i fall victim to it you know like when times are tough it's so hard to get yourself out of that you know like it's so hard to not be thinking about how you know how tough things are and and then you want yeah. to, and then you just start talking about it and it comes out and you know you sound needy you sound desperate mm -hmm. you know and exactly. it's, it's a hard practice yeah. it's a hard I, I just i think it comes down to the awareness piece being really aware yeah. what you're thinking about what you're saying and if you find yourself in that kind of habitual pattern of um you know uh victim victim yes. mentality mm -hmm. and you're like oh i'm being kind of a victim right now poor me poor me whatever it happens <laughs> to be oh we're no good we're not doing what we should be doing yes. um you know you can get stuck in that l loop and then and then you're stuck and yes. then it, it, it kind of breeds that uh 
it's almost like a self fulfilling prophecy. It is. It is. And it's breeds, almost, yeah, it breeds the, like the fear, the self doubt, and that keeps going. It snowballs. People sense that they don't want to work with you, and all of a sudden, it's like it just all goes downhill. Yeah, I just and, listened to. Oh, yeah, go ahead. And, and I, I say it's more, especially when you are like in in that kind of when you experience that kind of feelings, the uncertainty. That's why I'm very big believer in mastermind group and and having a mentor mm. because I believe. Your environment is always more powerful than your willpower. Willpower, I think, could only get you so so far. It's like I have a good friend of mine. You know, he's been trying to say, "I want to quit smoking. I want to quit smoking. I'm going to be quit smoking." I've been hearing that for ten years. While all your friends smoke, your wife smokes. How the hell can you quit? It's very very difficult. The he's in that, and yeah, so he's in that environment unless he gets out of that peer group. So it helps when you are. Let's see, even you're having some challenges in business when you are in a mastermind group or have a mentor. Oh, yeah, whatever problem you have, I experienced that 10 years ago. Or, oh, that's no problem. Just do this and this problem solve. Or talk to this person. Or, like, whatever you think is the big fucking problem is, somebody's experienced that many, many years ago. It's so true. It's, it's not a big deal. But we, without that comparison, you, without the environment, you're like, you're in this kind of black box bubble. you don't whatever. know yeah. you don't know you just yeah. don't know when it actually it's not that big of a deal and it can be uh a bit of a trap for entrepreneurs too like that entrepreneur like you said who wants to go it alone yes he looks at it as a battle i gotta do this <laughs> and, it, and it ties into their self-worth and if yeah. they ask for help they're desperate and they're needy yeah. and i was one of them like you know i got it i mean i get to do things my way nobody yeah. tells me what to do it's my way the highway now every single company that i have I have a business partner i don't do anything alone I think that's huge. I, think I don't do anything absolutely alone. I don't want to do anything alone. Like, I, I, again, I, I wouldn't want to do this business without at least one other partner like you, like mm-hmm. yourself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, just, I mean, we, we divide up our, our labor pretty well. Yes. And what we do and work on different things. Yes. Uh, and if we had to do it all, I don't know. Uh, like, just, it wouldn't be, be able to get this. To, to, yeah, to be at this scale, it just wouldn't be either possible physically to do it or it would just your health would be done yes yeah know? and the success will not be a sweet without someone to share with mm. it's so true it's it true. will not be a sweet yeah it's good you guys would be like you know looking back as you guys now opening more locations right yeah now three locations now right yeah yeah three so you know when you have more locations when you at, at that you know, mountain top. You're like, hey, buddy, remember ten years ago when we oh. came with that idea? When we did that, remember, like the first year. Oh my God, right? Yeah. Hey, man, look at where we are. It's it's so much sweeter. And right? it's it, that's so true too, because when you look back on it, those big problems <laughs> oh, were really that big, right? At the time, it seemed so monstrous, yeah. so huge. unsolvable. Yeah, yeah, and but you it's look not. Back and you laugh about it. It's not. So it's that that mindset mentality is such yeah. a healthy one for the entrepreneur. How do you? How would you suggest uh, someone goes if they're trying to find a mentor? Uh, the, the truth is, they're everywhere. Yeah, they they never ask. It's like uh, sometimes people ask me how I get some of these guests on my on my podcast, Shoulders of Titans. I've interviewed founder of Priceline dot com, CEO of Freelancer dot com, like billionaire entrepreneur. And I, people ask me, well, how do you get these people, Dan? Like, what secret connection you have? I said, you want to know my secret? It's called fucking email. <laughs> <laughs> you, you email the guy. And then it's called LinkedIn. It's not rocket science. But people just don't ask. It's, so there's not lack of agree. mentors out. People don't ask. I would agree. Like, I mean, we've been, do, we've been in business for a while now. We've been doing this business for over three years. And for the most part, people very rarely um, say, hey, how'd you do it? They almost, almost never, mm-hmm. almost never, you mm-hmm. know, it's, it's funny. Yeah. You know, I wonder how common that really is. It, it's very, people don't ask when all my, okay, put it this way. I'm always very, very, I'm fascinated. I'm curious about business companies and, and people. So it's something like this. I would love to interview you guys. How do you do it? How do you come up with the idea? How does that work? How does yeah. the equipment work? Like, like it's everything I do. Like how many clients can you do per, per day? You know, what are you doing to get clients? How do you train the staff? Everywhere I go, my you mind, learn. yeah, it, it, I, I, it doesn't turn off. It's right. like sometimes my wife, after the interview, we'll, we'll go to dinner. It's like a date night. Um, awesome. That's why I'm all dressed up. And so when I go to a restaurant, sometimes, you know, I would go into a restaurant looking at, Huh, I wonder how much they're paying in rent. 
Mm-hmm. I wonder how many staff they're they breaking it down. No, it's, and then I look in the menu. Mm, that's a very the way they write this the description, the copy. <laughs> I, I love it. And my wife is like, "Hey, can you just give it Enjoy a rest? The meal for five yeah, minutes." Yeah, it's like, yeah, but oh man, the, the waiter, the way he does the upsell, the wine is so so spectacular. I do the exact. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I, you know, I, I used to do that. I don't yes. do that as much anymore. Yes, I used to go into a business and just start breaking it down. Yes, you know, I don't know. You it, know, it, for me, it was fun. It was entertaining. It's it's it's. But that's how we are wired. Yeah, you know, it doesn't mean we have to do that business, but it's it, we exercise our intellect. Because business, at the end of the day, is an intellectual sport. So we exercise the intellect, and we think about things. We think about possibilities and solutions. Doesn't mean we have to do them, but yeah. if I can get to know your business in my mind, if I can think of ten ways that can improve it, doesn't mean I have to do it. Doesn't matter to tell you how to do it. But it's a mental it, exercise. It's a mental exercise. What's your approach to say competition? How do you how do you personally relate to competition? I think you have to. It's like the, I think the movie Godfather. Got to keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer. I think you have to know your competition very very well. You got to spy on them. You got to know what they're doing. You got to know their strength and weaknesses. This comes for the art of war, Sun Tzu, right? Know your enemy and. You have to know. I think again, most entrepreneurs they operate in the only the box. I'm minding my own business. What are my competitors are doing? I don't know. But shouldn't you know, like what kind of promotion is kind of they're planning to do? Uh, when are they gonna do them? Uh, are, is there something happening with them? Then, like, there's so many possibilities. Yeah, you, you I, have to know. I see it firsthand uh, quite a bit, and, and it's, it's so important to know what's going on. And uh, yeah, you don't want to be reactive all the time. If somebody keeps undercutting your prices or something like that, and it happens over and over, and you're not responding to it at all, it's, it's, it's going to affect you. Yeah, and if you're smart, you could this you could profit from your competition, not just crutch from the competition. Maybe you can see, or maybe it's a way we could do a joint venture. Maybe it's a way we can work together. Maybe we can cross promote. Maybe we can. There's so many possibilities. So many possibilities. Don't be so closed minded. You know, one yeah. thing I attempted to do last year was um, put together. Uh, a North American wide marketing campaign for the entire float industry. And mm. right now there's around 400 or so float centers in North America. Nice. And they're all pretty much independent, except yes. for like we're one of the bigger ones. And there's a couple in the States that are a little bit bigger as well. And I, re- I really wanted to rally them mm. and say, hey, let's harness our email list, let's harness our social media, yes. push this campaign yes. out. A couple people, a couple of them kind of got on board with it. They did it a little mm-hmm. bit, mm-hmm. and most of them just didn't. You know, they, they might have posted, you know, the, the campaign once on social media, and then let it fizzle out. And there was a whole thing that was supposed to be ongoing, driving mm-hmm. traffic. It was like a photo contest, and this thing that could have gone really viral if everyone pushed it. However, they didn't, mm-hmm. and we had people even not participating because they thought that I was doing this in some kind of a weird way. Like I was, I was, I was looking trying to take customers from there. something. Okay. And I'm like, no, like, yeah. believe it or not, I want to just market this industry better or yes. more, reach more people. Yes. That was my main thing behind it. Yes. And people, people say, oh, well, you might, you're going to own the content. So technically if I use the content, you could sue us for it. I'm like, no, like I'm, I'm saying use it, you know? And, and that entrepreneur has the scarcity mindset. Yeah, that's the difference, right? So he or she hasn't learned the lesson yet. Right. That they I mean, there's so much abundance, there's so much money out there. You don't need to worry about that stuff. How, how are we doing for time? We are at uh, 53 minutes. Wow, yeah. it flies, right? Wow, it always does. It's, I thought we like 30 minutes. Yeah, into it's okay. so much. I mean, this, these podcasts are so much fun, and they all, that's how they always. I go. love it. I, I was going to ask you really quick. Um, what are some of your keys for raising capital? Mm. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty simple. You raise money when you don't need it. <laughs> so no, when you when you need it, like oh, you know what, I gotta meet payroll next next month. <laughs> I need some money. No, uh, and don't approach because I've been on both sides, right? Raising capital also as an investor. So I would say, investors as an investor myself, I don't invest in an idea. Uh, just I, I invest in a proven business model. So something that has already gotten a little bit of traction that I know that. If I put money into it, it would scale the business versus, oh, it's a great idea. Nobody's ever done it. It's going to be the next Facebook. I'm not interested in that, right? Too high risk. Yeah, it's too high risk. Uh, I am more, I'm a very active investor. I don't just put money and hope it works. I put money in. I put I, I put in my time, I, I, my contacts, my network, my resources. I want to make it work. So you do the best to actually improve that business. Yeah, well. that's why. So so you know, there are some people who who say that they they invest in the entrepreneur. I do invest in the entrepreneur. That's I would say, maybe one third of it. One third it would be the entrepreneur. One third would be the business model, and one third is the marketplace. 
I look in the market, are we, are we delivering a unique solution? Again, who are the competitors? So market intelligence to me, it's very critical. Yeah. I, I do information gathering. I do a ton, like a ton of research. People are shocked. Like when I go into an industry that I don't know, how much research I do within a short period of time. People are like, wow. You just dig into it. I just, people, like, my, my partner would be like, holy shit, within a, a month. You become an expert on Yeah, like, it just, I'm very intense that way. I, I yeah. mean, I've got a library at home, over 2,000 books and, you know, stuff like that. But like, intense. Well, you're minimizing your risk by doing that. Totally. Like, I want to know inside and out. If I'm going to do it, I want to know inside and out. I want to know it better. I want to know their problems better than they do. So we can offer in a way that's compelling to them, right? Uh, and I could do that also because I can... Because I'm involved with different industries, I have, I'm not tied to it. I can borrow best practices from different industries. And, and you, you, when you insert something, bring something to an, into an industry, a new way of doing things, they think is brilliant. Well, it's not brilliant. They've been doing this in another industry for 10 years already. Yeah. It's like, well, what's so brilliant about it, right? Yes. It's like, let me give an example. Let's say for Cham Junction, it's an e-commerce business. We sell jewelry online. And when we are um, looking at our customer base, I'm like, okay, most of our customers are coming from a small town. Why are they buying from us? Because for them to drive to a mall, it's a, it's a pain in the butt. Yep. That's who our target market is. I said, that's interesting. Um, and most e-commerce, you buy, they ship your stuff, and that's about it. I'm like, okay, who are our customers? Of course, housewife, woman. That's our customer base. I said, why don't we get them on the phone? Let's add telephone sales to our business. Like, that's not new. Like, telephone sales is not new. Okay, as soon as we add that, our transaction size before it was, let's say, two three hundred dollars an order. We double and triple that. So because we get on the phone and say, "Yeah, I'm buying this charm for my daughter. I'm buying this for my mom." I'm da 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 da. And then they look at it. Oh yeah, but show us your bracelet. Take a picture. Do you know if you add these other charms, it will look that much better? Oh yeah. Okay, let's add more to it. Woman, it's it's how they buy. Just adding that one little component to it, it it just skyrocket ourselves. It's not rocket science. It's just common sense. Yeah, taking something old, put it in e-commerce. But it's like, think about it. How often you buy something from the e-commerce site, you get a telephone call? Never. Never. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. It's just... It's just it's 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 a uh, old wine in a new bottle. That's right? it. You're just taking something that was that's, been, that's been done for a long it, time, it. and now you're adding it. Yeah. And it's kind of nice because um, it does add a little bit of a personal feel to the whole thing. That's it. You're actually talking to a human being instead of just emailing and going to a website. Yeah, like and then you get your stuff. That's no personal touch because yeah. we know our customers. The uh, we get we get a lot of business from our repeat customers. They buy one. Sometimes they buy one one charm. charm yeah. And but they, they're testing us, and then they will buy more. And sometimes it's even funny. They'll buy a a maybe a cheaper version of the charm, and after the conversation, oh, let's upgrade it to gold, like from silver mm. to gold. Now that makes a difference in, yeah. in our profit margin, right? Yeah. And we call we and and the funny every single we call them jewelry consultant. Yeah. Jewelry consultant. Every single jewelry consultant we hire, they were our customers from one point or another. So they they love to brand themselves. They can talk about it. I wear it, uh, you know, and they could talk about it with passion. And they could, I say, you know what? Spend 30 minutes on the phone with a client. I don't care. I'm not like dinging you for, oh, you spend an hour on the phone with a client. No, no, talk. Talk with them. Get to know their life. That's, that's awesome. Building a relationship. That's it. And that's why they call back and they can place a $2,000 order, $3,000 order, $5,000. Just think about the trust of buying from a jewelry from an e-commerce site. That's trust. Yeah, hmm. yeah, absolutely. So something like that. Amazing. Just an example. It seems like you've been in business for a long time. Yes. And uh, it seems like you've been really diving down the entrepreneurial rabbit hole for a while. Yes. And uh, it's amazing what the knowledge you have. And uh, are you looking forward to TEDx Stanley Park? Oh, yes, I am. Uh, it's actually one of, my, one of my dreams. I wrote that uh, on probably... Quite a number of years ago, as a speaker, that well, you know what? What, what if, if something I can get on TEDx? Then wouldn't that be nice, right? It's the cream of the crop. It's the cream of the crop, yeah. and and I, I reply, you know, the little backstory. I would actually reply, uh, apply for TEDx, different cities, and I've gotten probably in together ten rejections, hmm. ten rejections, hmm. amazing. Until I got this one, right? Roger, he's crafty. Yeah, until he, I got I think this one. He knows well, how many how many Asian what's the Asian population in Vancouver? <laughs> <laughs> right? 
Oh, yeah. but also he knows that uh, with like we've done Roger and I, we're good friends. We've done different events together. Yeah, I'm a strong promoter because I also have a meetup group called Vancouver Entrepreneurs Group. Yeah, he, right? he promotes that all the time. So, so, I, I've never been there. Oh come on, good? man. It's good. I don't know. <laughs> you gotta, oh. you gotta oh. come and see, man. <laughs> I gotta come and see. I've heard. You I hear about him a lot from Roger. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So uh, and so, but I'm I'm happy that I finally you know we got to be on TEDx and and you know and also some of my friends are also on TEDx, right? So that's awesome. Who, who, who together. Your, your friends? That you, I, Iman. Iman's my good friend, right? Iman. Iman. Which one? Yeah, is, a I, guy. I should. In, is a good interview? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. What does he do? He's also a an educator. He teaches people how to create online courses. Iman. Okay, Iman. I'll get him on too. Yeah. How long Iman. are you, you going to be speaking for? I think TEDx just maximum 16 minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're short. They're short. Cool. Which is very hard. Yes. It's I can talk like no script for hours. Right. But to make it... To make a point in like eleven minute, twelve minute, it's make actually it concise, make it interesting, and very get hot. something like drive it it's home. It's very hot. Right. We 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 have revised the script probably I don't know a dozen times. I was gonna say, what stage are you at with your? Oh, final is final. Okay. Yeah, that so rehearsal everything. It's who's all your coach? So, um, Gobinder. Gobinder Gill, Gobinder, my yeah. buddy. Gobinder. I love Gobinder. Yeah, Gobinder. He's I been very helpful. Him actually at yeah. Toastmasters on Wednesday. Yeah, very been helpful. Very helpful. He's great. He's a great speaker. He's yeah. very experienced. Yeah. 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 So he's helped me craft craft a script and multiple times and changes and uh, stuff. Oh, you're gonna rock it. It's gonna be fun. It'll be fun. Big I, look, crowd. I look forward to it. Like what, I, I like it because I'm the first one. I'm done. I just sit there and enjoy the rest of the day. You know what Pretty the funny cool. thing is too? Um, usually in these kind of things, people remember the first and the last speakers. Yes, for, of course. So yes. it's an advantage Primo for spot. you. For sure. That's yep. good. That's Very good. cool. Uh, I remember the TEDx Stanley Park last year. That's the one I remember the most. Oh, wow. It was the first speaker and the last. And last The last speaker. was pretty cool too. Yes. So yes. You don't want fun. to be the one that's after lunch. That would not after, be good. People are just like, <laughs> that would not be coma. good. <laughs> I'm not paying attention at yeah, all. I think the yeah. first one is good. Yeah, I think so too. Well, awesome. Um, well, Dan, thank you so much for joining us I today. Appreciate it. it was I appreciate a lot of fun. It. I had a great time talking to you. I learned a lot myself. And if you'd like to learn more about Dan Locke, visit the website, uh, danlock.com. Do you have any social handles? Any uh, yeah, Twitter? I mean, from, from there, it's all from YouTube. So yeah, just go to Dan Locke and you'll yeah. find all his stuff. And uh, of course, you can always check him out at TEDx Stanley Park coming up on May 28th. 28th. Very it's cool. Be an epic event, or as Roger said, legendary event. Legendary. legendary, legendary. That's right. Awesome. So thanks for tuning in, folks. If you liked what you heard today, you know, give us a rating and a review on iTunes. That definitely really helps. Like, subscribe, share with your friends, and uh, we'll see you next time, or you'll you'll hear us next time on Vancouver Real. Until next time. Until next time. To whatever is. To whatever is.